it's very, well, pleasurable to be here and, and, and indeed pleased to be talking to Samson because I know you very long time already. I mean, we were together at the Institute. I'll talk a little bit about indeed uh, the things we discussed there. And uh, we also played a lot of tennis there, which was fun. You taught me how to play a nice surf and, and uh, taught me many things about that, but also about physics. I'm going to talk about that. Um, indeed, uh, I didn't announce the talk yet, the title yet, because I had sort of two topics in mind. Um, but this is the title, The World as an Anomaly. I mean, we're talking about anomalies. And the idea is basically that uh, I think that eventually the physics laws that we have in nature uh, are possible to derive from something deeper, something more underlying. And then, well, what is controlling uh, the interactions and everything like that? I mean, since Samson has been working on anomalies, there's actually an idea I want to present in this uh, talk that has to do with the fact that we want to derive basically all of physics from uh, an anomaly in some form. So I know uh, Samson's work, I mean, from early on when he was already, uh, well, I think he was still in, uh, in, in the Leningrad in the, where he worked with Anton uh, on this uh, idea of quantizing the Via Zorro group using, uh, well, a method that used a geometric action um, on the on the orbit of this Via Zorro uh, group. Uh, it's work that influenced my own, uh, well, papers a lot. Actually, I thought about it at the time. It was just before, uh, at the time when I had moved to Princeton. And within a year from that, I, I met Samson also there. And we spent two years uh, at the Institute discussing another topic and we almost collaborated on a paper on uh, background uh, independent open string theory, string field theory. Yeah, it's just Berlin there, but yeah. I, I put it there, indeed, the acknowledgement says, I would like to thank Eric Flynn for collaboration in the initial stages of the work. So I dropped out. I still feel guilty about this, so I want to make up that a bit. And so I'm going to talk indeed about uh, also open uh, string theory. Um, but uh, since it's an idea that I've been having uh, like uh, about 20 years ago, I had to, uh, I never published that one as well, by the way. I had to sort of remind myself of what my ideas were. And um, so this is one reason why I didn't, dis uh, wasn't sure I would, should be able, should, was possible to talk about uh, this one. So I, I chose two topics, which have to do actually with both of these papers. Part one will be uh, basically thinking about the symplectic form of the low energy theory. So we have physics in our world and we can uh, describe it in terms of uh, quantum mechanics, but also sort of classically. And one of the basic ingredients is, is the symplectic form. But there may be an underlying microscopic theory and I'm going to present evidence for the fact that the symplectic form in our of the physical world is actually derived from a Berry curvature of the underlying theory. Uh, this is actually connected to the, to the work that uh, Ant Anton and, and, and Samson did on, on this uh, geometric phase because that's going to be uh, a particular example. Then the part two I'm going to indeed think about open string field theory and there I'm going to think about as indeed as sort of arising from an uh, anomaly. That's correct. So the two, two are kind of related. Although the, the generalization I'm going to discuss is actually more, more general. So this is indeed the, the geometric action that uh, Samson and, and Anton wrote down on uh, the Vero Zorro group. So it's on, on, uh, on uh, the diff S1, diffeomorphism of, of a circle. And it has the form of sort of like a Wessomino term, uh, but then expressed in terms of a function that is a reparameterization on, on, on the circle. Um, and indeed, you can think about this uh, action as a uh, berry phase of a action of the group on a state. If you take a highest weight state, actually this is uh, made very precise in work recently by Oblak. Uh, then you can compute the Berry phase by looking at the, well, the, the change in the parameter f and you integrate this change over the orbit and you find a Berry phase and actually turns out that Berry phase has precisely that, that form. And of course this is a, a form from which we can derive also a uh, 
a Berry curvature, I mean here, and then this would be the same as deriving the symplectic form for this, uh, this action. So this is an example of a connection between a Berry phase and a, a anomaly, because this is also how one way of thinking about this um, uh, action. So I'm going to generalize this. Um, sorry, this is... Well, first of all, I'm going to put it in a context of uh, ads cft and you can indeed uh, talk about uh, this geometric action also in that context by thinking about uh, special geometries in three dimensions in the ADS <coughs> space, which I depict here as a cylinder with, with a boundary, which is the circle. Uh, if you write down the usual uh, ADS geometry, uh, you can apply a reparameterization, or you actually can write down the BTZ geometry anyway, but you can apply a reparameterization on the boundary, which is some diff S1. Actually, in this case, we have two reparameterizations that work on the X plus and the X minus coordinates. So X plus minus are the combinations of the time and the angle. Um, and then these functions that appear in here are, are functions of either X plus or X minus. And they can be written in terms of the Schwarzschild derivative of this function F. And this is a parameterization of uh, a set of geometries in, in three dimensions. If you insert this into the action in the bulk, uh, you can, because it's an, a solution to the equation of motion, rewrite this into a boundary action, and that boundary action exactly has again this form of the geometric action. And this is something that had been worked out uh, also in detail and recently by, in a paper by Kotler and Jensen. But what I'm claiming is that this is a, a special case of a much more general story, um, because I'm going to be talking about more general boundary, uh, well, first of all, ADS spaces in our arbitrary dimensions, but also thinking about more general uh, geometries or, or even classical solutions uh, in the bulk that are, um, uh, well, obtained from some arbitrary fields. So I'm going to actually use uh, a notation that, that was introduced by Bob Walt to talk about just fields in the bulk, very generally, where we have a Lagrangian in the bulk, where if you vary the Lagrangian with respect to the field, so the fields may include the metric or anything else, and then uh, if you vary it, you get the equations of motion, but then you also get a total derivative, which precisely defines for you the symplectic potential. So we're going to be looking at field configurations in, in ADS space that satisfy the equations of motion, and they define a phase space, and then you can derive the symplectic form from the symplectic potential by, again, varying once more, and then you have a two-form on the space of uh, uh, variations of these fields. Now, the solutions of the equations of motions are determined uh, by, because they're, uh, well, they can be equations of motion of various type, but we're going to assume that when we specify the boundary conditions of these fields on, on the cylinder, that the solution is uniquely uh, fixed. So the phase, these, these parameters, actually the, the fields on the boundary are parameterized in the classical uh, phase space. And so they will enter also in, in when we're going to construct the symplectic form. So this is a generalization of this story uh, for more general um, fields in, in, in ADS. And uh, as I said, I mean, this can be having um, metric field, so we're going to assume uh, later on also that this is a, a, a reparameterization invariant um, field theory, and that means also I can construct uh, conserved charges associated to that. But first let me think about these fields as quite arbitrary. They're actually connected through the ADS-CFT correspondence to operators on the boundary, because the microscopic theory is going to be living here, and it's a CFT. And of course, that's the usual rule that when we calculate the classical action of this, um, this theory, it will tell us something about the partition function of states uh, computed on the boundary. Sorry, Eric, what actually can constitute the subjective form? Is it two form for... What is the content? Sorry, what is... What does it constitute for? What does it represent exactly? The symplectic form? Yeah. It, it's something that can, will allow us to, to define Poisson brackets or whatever on, on the phase space. It's a standard, I don't do anything else here. I mean, I'm just thinking about the classical, sp the space of classical solutions of a, of a field theory in the bulk. But it also has an interpretation on the boundary because these objects are actually associated to 
uh, operators that I can connect to the boundary states. And indeed there's a bulk symplectic form which I write down here more explicitly. Um, they are closed on shell, that means that I, I have an uh, equation like this that if I take the d of this, uh, I uh, actually can show that it's zero if I assume that these, equation, these fields satisfy the linearized uh, equations <coughs> of motion. So I have both equations of motion assumed as well as the linearized equations of motion of these variations, then this form is closed. Now this integral is being done over this slice, which is a time slice in the bulk, but since it's a closed form, I can deform this integration surface because it's going to be close everywhere, say below or above, so I can push it to the boundary and that's actually going to help me to interpret the same quantity in terms of something that's living on the boundary. Um, indeed, it's possible to write it um, like this, where instead of integrating over sigma, I'm integrating over the boundary of sigma, which is the circle, or a sphere uh, times a uh, real line and it's actually the real line just say going, going to the past. I have a similar expression going to the future because it's closed in the bulk. And this is an expression that you can exp well evaluate now in terms of the boundary values. So you will see that this expression actually has components that are related to the fields phi but there's also a symplectic form that basically tells you that these fields, which are the boundary fields, are dual to objects that are, uh, well, basically the derivatives perpendicular to the boundary. Those derivatives are related to the expectation values of operators on the boundary. So there's going to be an expression I can write down here that is uh, a boundary uh, interpretation of the same form. Uh, and as I said, it's a bulk quantity, but it's also a boundary quantity because of this uh, closeness of this uh, omega. In two dimensions, a special thing happens that equations of motion are holomorphic equations, like d bar <coughs> or something, it's, everything gets simplified because of that. Because uh, in two dimensions, uh, of course, of the gravity equations, but I, I will come C to... If it's CFT, then equation of motion is some kind of holomorphicity equation, like d bar of j equals zero, or d bar of Schwarzian equals to zero, and things get simplified. This is true when it's pure gravity, but here I'm actually talking also about uh, other fields in the bulk. And so there can be any operator on here. So I can switch on couplings for these operators. And so I have a huge class of perturbations I'm looking at. And this is an infinite dimensional space, much larger than just the space of repermentations. I, I meant only the case of gravity. Yes, I understand. Um, so what I'm going to do now, I'm going to think about uh, states uh, in, the, in the CFT uh, that are going to be associated indeed with these boundary values. So you can think about them as being constructed by a path integral where I specify these boundary conditions. Uh, they also uh, represent of course states in, in the dual theory because of the correspondence. But I'm interpreting this now as a calculation on the boundary where I have a family of states and then if I vary it, I can define the connection and then in this case it would be the Berry connection and the Berry curvature can be written uh, in this form. I'm going to make this more precise because of course here I have to specify uh, which fields are we really de this, uh, states depending on because uh, we are dealing with a phase space and therefore we should uh, choose some polarization where uh, the states can only be dependent on, on say, half of the, the variables in, in, your, uh, in your phase space. Uh, there is a natural choice for this, uh, which is coming from the fact that I have radial quantization. So there's one way that I can think about the states here are being created by operators that act in the past, and I'm going to think about uh, preparing this state in, in not in, in real time, but sort of in Euclidean uh, time. And then I'm going to define what are called coherent states because then uh, if you have a radial quantization you can think about say the origin as being the point at t equals minus infinity and I, I draw a circle here in, in the plane which is this circle here on the cylinder. And then there's a correspondence between, I call now the, the, the coupling constants lambda because they're actually complex valued and they are uh, related to the operators here. And 
have a basis of operators, it's going to be all operators in the CFT. Uh, I can also take their derivatives and this is why I'm indicating some, some labels in here. And uh, so these functions, these, these actually are then coefficients of functions that are multiplying these operators. So there's an, another way of writing the same expression where here there's a sum over i. Instead of having these derivatives, I put, choose some function that depends on, on the time, Euclidean time. It's a, a time that indeed goes up to t equals zero. And then I act with this exponent. There's some time ordered in here uh, on the state zero, which is the, the vacuum state that I started from. But by doing this, I've turned on uh, couplings, which are associated to the boundary values of those fields. And they uh, indeed parameterize part of the, the state, actually the state in this case, but also part of the phase space. This is a more explicit expression if you want to think about what this integral is, because I'm also integrating over the angles. So I have uh, a lot of information in these coefficients. Um, indeed, in, 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 in gravity, you might think that this is only a function of a, little, a particular combination, as you say. But here I'm allowing even a more general case where these operators are functions of t and, 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 uh, and phi. More like in a style like Ed Edward and trying to define boundary. Like the bulk operator to boundary. Well, this is in, in its boundary field, th I mean in the field theory case as well, because there's a, a similar thing, of course, in, in string theory where you have the boundary and the open strings and the, right. and the closed string one. Yes, so there's some boundary couplings that we are switching on here. But of course, these coupling constants have to do with something with bulk fields as well, because they specify, as I said, the boundary conditions of the values of the fields in the bulk. And so there's also a classical solution associated to these parameters, provided I also uh, put boundary conditions on this other part. And this is where a nice thing happens. Uh, actually, you get uh, here, because of uh, I'm working in, in Euclidean, and here I'm going to think about, indeed, the antipodal map as sort of a complex conjugation. And I'm going to impose that if I have couplings here, that they satisfy some symmetry conditions. And then we, this is a complex variable. And here I put the same function except complex conjugate and I, I invert the time t. And so now I have a complete phase set of phase space variables, but it actually describes a Kähler structure on the space of couplings. And so uh, I can calculate, um, I think I missed a slide here. So first of all, there's uh, an inner product uh, that I can take because the partition function in the bulk will be the inner product of those, those two states. Uh, and that defines also uh, the Kähler form in, in my uh, Kähler structure. And so there is a symplectic form that I get from these parameters by evaluating these inner products and varying in this way. And that's a symplectic form that is defined on the boundary uh, in terms of these uh, coherent states. But as I wanted to argue that these, um, um, this symplectic form is actually the same as the symplectic form you would derive from the bulk equations by, uh, well, the procedure I described earlier. <laughs> but this, as I said, is, is a boundary construction in terms of uh, coherent states. Any questions about this? It's clear. Um, and I, indeed, when I take this bulk uh, symplectic form, uh, which was defined as an integral here, and I push it to the boundary, uh, then I did this earlier, then I get this integral on the boundary. If you do this for the, the parameterization in terms of coherent states, you will get this answer. But there's also an, an explicit expression you can write down, namely, um, one other way of choosing a polarization, and actually I learned this from Samson, there's always Dar Darbu variables. And the Darbu variables are actually the ones that where we take the couplings on one side and take the operator expectation values on the others. And so there is a, a Darbu way of writing this in a product where indeed you have the association between uh, couplings and operators as being derived from the symplectic uh, form. One precision is in this case, Darbu usually are considered as local coordinates, right? Well, I have to say that even these operators, if you think about the, the whole structure of the coupling constant uh, uh, manifold, they, they may be defined locally, uh, only locally. I mean, if you do reparameterization, if you do, yeah, there may be contact terms that are like, uh, 
uh, curvature. I mean, anyway, this is, this is probably a very similar uh, local uh, formula. Uh, of course, I made a choice to write it in this form, but there must be a way in which I just exchange lambda bar and I change some other operators I integrated over that side. But the two expressions must be, must be the same. Um, now note that here I still have an integral over uh, all of this geometry here. If you think about the Virozoro case, um, this would be the stress tensor, but this would be the metric. So it's not yet in the form where we use the, the dual field sort of like the, the, very, the, the on the orbits. For that, we namely, we expect to have an integral only over the, over the boundary here. So this expression is more general. Actually, uh, there's independent work. Actually, we've, we discovered this in, in, uh, in Amsterdam, but there was also work by Bill, these authors that sort of made the same uh, observations. Um, although what we also were interested in is in indeed how this works for, for gravity. Because one of the applications of this formalism is to try and derive uh, equations that are equivalent to the equations in the bulk, to the field equations in the bulk. So this is uh, just a definition of this uh, symplectic form, but I'm going to now uh, study a more general case, namely that indeed of diffeomorphisms. And here again I use this uh, ideas of Walt, uh, because there is a um, symplectic uh, current, actually there's a, sorry, a neutral current, where I use the, the potential, I mean I just write it in the usual form, so we have some symmetries associated to reparameterizations. These can be arbitrary vector fields, in particular I'm going to use this to construct the Virozoro generators. Um, and so this is some transformation on the fields and then this is the general form of a neutral charge. Uh, actually you can add a term to it which is a total derivative. This charge, of course, is conserved, but actually due to the uh, reparameterization invariance, it turns out this J actually is the D, identically to the D of some, some other object, which we call Q. Um, though that means that when we construct the Hamiltonian or the, or the other neutral charges associated to all these vector fields, they are again <coughs> written as integrals over this surface, but since J is a total derivative, they become integrals on, on the boundary. And indeed, this is what translates on the boundary to the integrals of the stress tensor. So this is a, a different expression, as I said again, as what I had on the previous slide, where I had integrals over the entire boundary. But now I have, for the, for the gravity case, I can have integrals over only the slice here. And this has to do with, with symmetries and actually ward identities, if you think about it from the boundary perspective. Excuse me. Yes? I, I, am I right that J is not the current, but the divergence of the current? Uh, and this is what I learned as sort of writing down a, a neutral current. It's the divergence of the neutral current. No. The D of this thing is zero. You, you want to have a bulk, okay. bulk, bulk okay. integral. I don't this, this. <laughs> this thing is a D, D um, minus one form which I can integrate. And it's the D of it is zero. Maybe I misunderstood the notation. Sorry. So the, 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 the object here is... The, it's the dual of the current as a vector. Uh, you mean Hodge dual? Hodge, it's a Hodge dual. It's the Hodge dual, dual of the U. It's namely, it's not, it's not a, uh, a vector, but it's, it's, it's a form. It's a form, a D minus one form. Actually, this is the, the most natural way to think about it because then, then the conservation law is just closed. Yeah. Yeah. The D dimension, the current is a D minus one. one form. And actually, it comes from this whole formalism because the, even it's the, li, uh, related to the symplectic potential. And here, here, of course, you also see it's a d minus one form. And actually, this, this term is important later because one thing we're going to be interested in is also the, the, the Hamilton equations. This is what, what Walt shows is that um, yeah, this term is important. Anyway, what I'm going to, before I get there, let me indeed translate this now to a, a boundary statement. I'm going to specify what b is in, in, in a minute. There's something needed here, namely to, to make sure that this uh, Hamiltonian that they find by integrating this, or actually this charge, satisfies the correct properties with the symplectic form that I also defined. And then this term is important. <coughs> 
but it doesn't mean anything because it's basically adding a total derivative to a current, which is like a kind of an improvement uh, term. There's a, a nice paper now by Daniel Harlow, which explains the uh, origin of this thing uh, more precisely by, by uh, making, by discussing actually that the action you write down in the bulk cannot be fully uh, defining a theory if you have a boundary, because you also have to write down boundary terms. And if you include those boundary terms, you actually understand also where these terms come from. Um, so the water identity is what I'm going to think about actually. Indeed, is, is there is this equation, namely, if I take this charge, which is an integral over this, I can write this again as an integral over the current. And now if I insert this expression, this psi I'm going to be assuming is going to be transferred uh, along the uh, the boundary, and then these uh, objects don't have any components along the boundary when you integrate. You only have these, this object that's being integrated. So this is the, the symplectic um, potential, which also on the boundary is a symplectic potential for the, this form that I also wrote down. So I had delta lambda delta o, o and this is actually a way of writing uh, then uh, the symplectic form. If you interpret this form this way, the other terms are also very natural. This was the integral of the stress tensor. This is the D of it. And this we normally call a water identity because it basically tells you that the divergence of the current actually tells you how all the fields are transforming uh, with the appropriate parameter that I have in here. So the water identity is basically naturally uh, following from these manipulations by writing these currents as boundary terms. Um, so that is actually a derivation almost of this fact that we, I can write j as the d of a q. Um, you can also look at the variations, and this is where indeed this term actually is important. If I didn't have this term in here, this equation would not fully work. Uh, this is an important equation because if you take the variation of this current, you get the delta of the first term, but you also get uh, the equations of motion in here. Uh, because I take the variation of the Lagrangian, but then also there's a term that gives you the potential again, symplectic potential, but there has to be a variation of this term that also combines together in such a way that you precisely end up with this combination. And this, of course, is, is again the, the symplectic uh, form, but now evaluated to two variations, one being the gauge transformation of associated to Xi, and the other one uh, an arbitrary variation. But now when you insert this into the definition of the Hamiltonian, which is the integral of this object, you find that uh, we integrate this side, which is the symplectic form, and this is the Hamiltonian, and then this actually is nothing but the Hamilton equations. So you derive the Hamilton equations from, from this, this identity. But it's important, and actually of course it's not a surprise, that we use the equations of motion in the bulk, because this is another way of writing the equations of motion. So this is one way I actually, I, I wanted to, why I was interested in this. These equations also now have boundary interpretations of a more microscopic nature where we think about this as a symplectic form, but in the bulk it's the equation of motion. So there's some way in which the equation of motion must be derivable from the boundary uh, by interpreting this equation. Well, because phase space is the space of solutions of the equation of motion. That's right, but we have the phase space in our, our uh, in our disposal. You're right, in, in a certain sense we already projected on the solution space, but you want to know of course which equations are being uh, obeyed in the bulk. But you're right, I mean it's true that there's a uh, kind of a little bit of a tautology in the sense that the boundary only knows about the, f f the, f the boundary states and therefore it should be, uh, there's some equations that need to be imposed. But there's a whole industry of people that have been trying to derive the Einstein's equations from uh, these kind of manipulations and that actually uh, works in a slightly different setting than, than the one I described here. Namely, uh, this is a picture I should have, yeah, this is the one I wanted. Um, so I, I first of all I can uh, look for Banyanas geometries. Um, and I, this is a little bit of a complicated picture. I mean, here I've done something uh, slightly different than th the setup that I had before. Here I had time going upwards, you think about just, but these vector fields can be 
chosen to be quite arbitrary, they can be uh, boost generators in the bulk as well. So if I think about boost, they actually create horizons. And this is the picture I have here. So here I have a generator, which is a boost generator, which has a horizon in the bulk, which is these planes. And this is a picture of uh, Rindler space, actually, in... Um, in um, actually, you have this. No. I think I'm missing, I'm missing a slide. Um, so this is a Rindler space where there's a, a, a time flow this way, and there's a generator of this, which is this operator, which again can be written as an integral of the charge. Um, so this is a, a called the model Hamiltonian. It's the integral of the uh, stress tensor times uh, this vector of psi again. This equation actually is an um, equation um, for the variation of what's called the relative entropy. I'm actually a little confused why my slides are not... Relative oh, here. You mean Boltzmann entropy, right? Boltzmann entropy? It's classical, no. right? Classical Boltzmann. No, it's... Um, actually, I think I... Yeah, uh, this slide should have been uh, without these equations first. Uh, l just look at the top, the top uh, equation here. There's a uh, object that's called, uh, th which is the, the stress tensor integrated against psi, which is called the uh, model Hamiltonian. If you take the difference with that and the um, entanglement entropy, you get a combination that we call relative entropy. And the entropy is the entanglement entropy, the quantum entanglement entropy across this surface. So there are uh, various contributions. One that is an integral over uh, this boundary, and this, this is an integral over this boundary. And uh, this is the symplectic form again, but now only integrated uh, over this part of the space. And so there's an identity that tells you that the difference between the entanglement entropy across this surface and, and the charge there is equal to this uh, symplectic. Entanglement entropy means the von Neumann entropy, right? So you have here a situation where we split the space into two parts, and so there's an entanglement across this region. I'm not going to uh, spend a lot of time on this because, I mean, it's sort of a side remark. Um, there's an expression uh, which is uh, due to Cardi, and Calabrese of uh, what kind of entanglement entropy I have here. No, no. But why is it defined? That usually it uh, is ill-defined, the entanglement entropy, if you have two wedges adjacent to one another. So the, uh, yeah, that's a very good point. I also made that point when, when uh, Van Ramsung was uh, talking about it. There's some way of regulating this at these points. Uh, you can even split these points a little bit by having another uh, interval in between. And then you can uh, have a, a finite uh, factor in the middle. Yeah. Actually, this has been discussed quite recently by, by um, Faulkner in quite a beautiful way, that you indeed have the, the finite, uh, you can regulate this in a nice way. And actually, these expressions also come from regulating uh, these, these entanglements. Anyway, it's just a generalization of these neutral charges which uh, Walt introduced, where instead of integrating this quantity Q over this region, you integrate it here. But the identities are the same because they again use the fact that the D of uh, the variation of the current is the symplectic form, and that's what's here in the bulk. Anyway, there's actually, uh, what I wrote down these equations is actually the, the application if you would do this for Banyadas geometries. So think about this as ADS3. And I have here uh, a boundary state that's parameterized by a function f, the same functions that Samson considered, namely in diff s1. Then uh, there is actually a, a, an entanglement entropy expression that is given by the difference between the locations of these endpoints. So there are two points, x1 and x2. And this is the reparameterization that you would do. And this is the expression of the killing vector field that actually uh, you have to integrate on the boundary. It's zero on these endpoints, so that's the boost generator. And it's normalized in a particular way. And then it's multiplying the Schwarzschild derivative because that's the expression for the stress tensor on the, on the boundary. And then this variation minus that variation must be some expression that we can integrate in the bulk that would, should be the symplectic form in the bulk. And it's some way of, of sort of deriving these equations of motion.
Uh, and as I said, I mean, this is a, a way of thinking about this, that this implies the linearized equations. I want to close this part. Uh, anyway, I, I just want to summarize that I, I discussed the uh, relationship between the Berry curvature in the boundary and the symplectic form in, 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 in the bulk. It's much more general than just uh, for, for gravity. It also has other fields uh, associated to that. Uh, you can try to derive the bulk Hamilton equations um, from the boundary, and I think this sort of uh, hints towards a derivation of the bulk equations from a more microscopic perspective. And there are some ideas of how to do this, and I described that if you do this for Banyadas geometries, you actually connect to this work of uh, Samson and, and Anton. So this is the first part. Uh, now I want to get to the, um, the other discussion, which is sort of related to the things that we were discussing at the time, which had to do with uh, background uh, independent open string theory. Um, I also indeed want to connect to the idea that uh, indeed that um, my think is that there is some way in which we can derive our field equations from an underlying theory. What I talked about it here was sort of like where we go from open strings to closed strings, which is one way in, in sort of thinking about an emergence step. But now I want to even go one layer deeper where I want to think about where the open strings may come from. And just the idea that uh, the open string field theory Lagrangian can be written down as a churn simons action sort of su suggests uh, this, this, uh, this relationship. So this was an idea I worked on about uh, 20 years ago. I I'm tr have tried to remember what I all thought about. Uh, I didn't write it down because indeed in the end there are some things that I'm not totally sure how they work, but I had some nice observations that I want to tell you about. So this is um, Ed Witten's original paper about non-commutative geometry and string field theory. Um, here uh, he writes uh, an action that looks indeed like the churn simons action, but it involves all kinds of quantities that they had to define, like star products. And he did this by gluing together the open strings in some way like this, where he chose a midpoint and there are two sides of the string that have to be matched together. But since this looks like a, a turn simons action, the natural question is, can we sort of think about this as, a, as a coming from an anomaly? And there were many other reasons why I thought there might be another formulation that is uh, dealing with, um, well, this, this interaction slightly differently. The idea would indeed to write down a action <coughs> that is not defined on the open string, but sort of on half of it. I want to think about this. Actually, there's, uh, of course, an issue, actually the same issue that you mentioned before. Actually, Witten had a problem of defining the half string because he wants to split the Hilbert space of the open string into two parts, which is not a very easy thing to do in this case as well, because actually uh, even the open string Hilbert space doesn't factorize in a left and a right. <coughs> Um, and there were all, all kinds of other issues. But anyway, what I wanted to indeed think about is, is what is the space of, so if I think about this as an algebra, what is the space that it's acting on? And it's uh, motivated also by, by Kohn's way of thinking, of course. Witten was already uh, inspired by that. But if he would have followed this uh, idea of having a spectral triple, I'm actually denoting the gauge field now with the same notation as the algebra because I'm thinking about A as being the, the algebra of open strings, which indeed is a star algebra, but then there's a Hilbert space. And then you may ask, what is this Hilbert space actually consisting of? And, and looking in the picture here, the Hilbert space must be associated to these half strings. So uh, the idea would be to write down this action where these are half string fields and then integrate out these well, fermion fields, do a computation of this sort and get back the other action. So wh what does it mean, this D plus A actually? Ah, so what I'm thinking about is there is a Dirac operator and I want to actually have some way in which I'm going to have a family of Dirac operators parameterized by my open... Uh, so A is not connection here? It, it's, I'm going to think about it as the connection. And this is the element of algebra A? Well, I mean, there's some, uh, let's put this in quotation marks in the sense that I want to think about the, 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 the indeed the, the open strings actually as the thing that are defining an algebra, just like here. So these are connections, but these are connections. Yeah. Always an element. 
They are not connections, they're open string fields. Mm -hmm. It's just a question of notation. A is an algebra. Uh, I know, I know. I, I, I'm sloppy here. Um, but the idea would be like this. I mean, if I um, have these open strings, and sorry for no using this notation, um, I'm multiplying, um, because I mean any states, open string states, should be possible to act on a state which is sort of half of a string state. And then the multiplication is like gluing those together. And then I obtain a new half string state, which is the product of those two. And so there's a midpoint that I have to put here, which is where the two sort of uh, have to meet. And so my half strings have one midpoint there and, and the other point, which is the open string on the other side. And the proposal I thought about was thinking about these half strings as sort of strings with mixed Dirichlet and Neumann boundary conditions. Because then I have a point which I fix and the other point is sort of free to move. And there's another reason why I like this because it's, uh, I'll, I'll explain in a minute, actually it's sort of natural form t-duality or things like this because Dirichlet and Neumann boundary conditions are exchanged. And this string doesn't know so much about which space it's moving on because it doesn't know whether it's, this is its, its one free state or that one. And as, as I'll explain here indeed, you can think about these endpoints sort of as being d minus one brains because they're kind of objects that are floating around in space. And as I said, t duality exchanges Dirichlet and Neumann boundary conditions. And there are many cases where the end strings play an important role and often appear to be more fundamental. One example I like is if you think about uh, a d brain system on d fours and d zeros, uh, you can write down the ADA. HM equations, uh, namely because if I have different kind of d-brains, then there are strings that are connected to one brain, say 4-4, four, four, but there's also the 0-4 strings, and they are like dn strings. And then you have some equations of this sort where uh, you can indeed uh, transform, uh, well, construct the, the, um, the dual gauge fields uh, sort of in, in the sense of t-duality by, again, computing uh, Berry phases. I mean, I'm, I'm not going to go into the details here. The ADM equations have data in them which are actually having uh, two numbers, namely k being the number of instantons, n being the, the, the rank of the gauge group, but then these objects are actually, th can be thought of as dn strings uh, in, in uh, <coughs> that's actually the way that these ADHM equations appear in string theory and similar in, in, in NAMP uh, constructions. Anyway. Just one question, can I uh, study the dynamics of this half string object, so d minus one branch? Can I form open strings or connecting them together to form closed ones? So one way I'm going to think about this, and actually this is what this equation suggests, is that if I glue together two of them, uh -huh. that then they would again become an open, an open string. But there's another way, namely you can also glue them on that side. And then actually they, they construct an object that lives in the t-dual space sign. Because a t-duality actually makes from this thing a Neumann boundary condition and this a Neumann. Exactly. Uh, and so there's some way in which t-duality can be thought of as cutting an open string in the middle and gluing it back together on the other side. The and that actually is the way that the NAM transformation actually works on the torus. It's basically uh, it changes the, the rank of the group with the, uh, the gauge uh, with the instanton number and the other way around. So the, the boundary conditions are being exchanged. So these objects actually, they live kind of on the space and it's t-dual in some, some way. Anyway, this was an uh, a point in space-time <coughs> or uh, a line? Uh, yeah, a good point. Uh, I'm, I'm now thinking of as a point in space-time because it's d minus one. But there are examples like if you do d0, d4, but then I have an additional time in them. You can also think about them as Euclidean d3 and d minus 1. I have not, uh, as I said, I mean, these are ideas I was developing and there are various variants that you can go into. But the most natural one would be to take d minus 1 brains, which are points. And then, then you also have to do a t-duality in all directions, including <coughs> time. So what do you say of this ADHM data on living on torus? I didn't understand. If you take the, there is a construction of 
the ADHM equations in string theory using open strings, where we have two kinds of brains, one describing the instantons and one associated to the rank of the case group. And the data are basically uh, objects that have two indices, namely k times n, k being the instanton number, n being the rank of the gauge group. Those objects are strings like this sort, where you have a Dirichlet boundary condition and a Neumann boundary condition. And so there's some way that the ADHM equation has this structure uh, in it. So, Eric, idea is basically that interpret Witten's 86 paper in a modern way <coughs> with your degree rather than thinking about things cutting in the middle or something. That's right. Mm -hmm. Think about the brain and give a, a notion of the A in the, uh, as an object which acts. Yes. Which changes the boundary condition, let's say. Yes, uh, but anyway, but these objects should be more fundamental in that sense that, that by integrating them out you should get the, the action. Anyway, this is, it was motivation, not, not uh, a full description. Uh, so what I want to do is actually construct so, sort of like what looked like a Dirac operator at the end. The idea would be uh, integrating them out to get this action. <coughs> and there are ideas that namely you can mimic what we do in two dimensions with the chiral anomaly, or there's a parity anomaly in three dimensions that also produces Jun Simons actions. And I want to do sort of a similar uh, calculation. So you can compute a determinant, expand it out, use things like collapse propagators or whatever, <coughs> some way that usually you calculate these, these uh, anomalies. The other idea is namely there's a three-dimensional space hidden here, even in, in, in witness action. That space is actually the, the, the Möbius group that acts on the sphere because this, the reason why there are three terms in here had to do with ghost number counting. These objects should be thought of as being one forms in some way where there's an integral that wedges them. There's can you shortly elaborate on this uh, stuff for the uh, properties on this queue? I'm going to actually define that now more precisely. Because there was actually a problem, I would have said, in, in Witten's construction. Wit Witten uh, defined his states, first of all, as uh, states in Hilbert space, this open string, they, they were, had ghost number minus a half. And in order to absorb all the right ghost numbers, he had to find, define something called the midpoint operator which was kind of a little bit of a funny thing because it's some exponent of a bosonized ghost field with a power three halves. If you would calculate the conformal dimension of this thing, it's some, some funny number like minus nine over eight. Another problem is that the splitting of the string is of in two halves is not very well defined. Actually, the, the, the Hilbert space doesn't factorize. While if you think about these things as operators, you would like them to be sort of in a, a tensor product of um, the dual vector space with itself. I'm going to try and solve both problems. I'm going to define a new uh, midpoint operator that's going to turn the usual open string field into an operator of this kind. And it works quite beautifully um, and precisely in, 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 uh, in a way that sort of uses the critical uh, dimension. The idea is actually the following. Um, if you think about the open string modes, they have a uh, mode expansion, so I'm using just the, the usual uh, string theory modes and the ghosts, and I'm going to split uh, these modes into the even modes and the odd modes. When you have the odd modes, when you restrict them to the half string, they already obey the mixed Dirichlet Neumann boundary conditions. So, one way I think about actually the open string, of course, the open string is, an, is a line. But you can think about the, the modes going to the left and to the right as if they're going around a circle. And I'm thinking about that circle now as being doubly winded, where there's a crossing point that's going to be the midpoint. So I'm going to split the string by making this crossing disappear. So they're going to be two untwisted ones. So what you then work out actually that the operator that I have to insert there actually is a twist operator which also twists the, uh, the x-coordinates as well as uh, one of the ghost fields. So I have two modes, which uh, two uh, fields, namely I'm going to actually split all the fields in the even and odd ones. So I have fields which I call C-, minus, which are the odd ones, and are plus fields. And then you twist the 
the even ones, that's this operator. This is going to be the twist operator for the even uh, ghost fields. And then I have this the operator as well. Together this has ghost number 3 has, which is the same number that Witten required. And so this new twist operator actually precisely splits it and actually makes of my string state something that is in this uh, product and actually is an operator that multiplies, uh, acts on half strings. And what's the dimension of it? It's, right. get the same it's conformal dimension is minus 1. This is 26 over 16, oh, which is 13 yeah. over 8. Minus 5 over 8 is 0. So this is an operator that you can put down in 26 dimensions that has conformal dimension 0. And it does exactly what you want. Namely, it splits uh, the, the strings into, in a way where it is becomes a, a product. So it really becomes an algebra now, because now I can start multiplying these things. So my uh, star product is basically just really multiplying <coughs> in, this, in this way. Can that be repeated for the uh, for super string that which I was not able to remember? Here yeah, the problem is in picture changing because there was no other way of defining super string to fill seven. I have to. Get, I didn't think about that. Anyway, if that was a problem. <laughs> that, uh, Anyway, the fact, I mean, I had this construction 20 years ago, and the fact that I have a twin brother, uh, as can also be proven by the fact that Herman actually invented this same construction recently when he was doing the TT bar deformations. He needed the same thing. And I could tell him about this fact. He hadn't noticed the, the Simon that I could multiply it so that it gets uh, dimension zero. And an, an important thing that they need furthermore, this operator commutes with the, with the uh, BRST charge, which is also a very important thing. Indeed, you can show this, uh, that Q, well, this is the BST charge, actually, it, it, with this new midpoint operator, actually, it, it, it's zero. And there's a very funny thing that I, I have to admit, I don't fully understand what is uh, happening there. So this is a C minus one, but this object, therefore, <coughs> has a spin one. It, this has the form of a C times a spin one. Indeed, if you have this operator, this is a spin field of uh, 26 bosons. Uh, so I say the, bo the bosonic string, and this is the, the, sorry, this is the twist field, I should say. Mm -hmm. This is the spin field for the ghost. So this object is a current that I can integrate and defines for me a new charge, which has ghost number a half. If you work out its square, you can really work it out using the operator product expansion. It gives you the BST charge. Something I, I don't fully uh, know why that is possible. But if you take this operator in its opera operator product expansion with it itself, actually the sigma with sigma gives you the identity, but then you have to expand because of the zeros here, and you pick up the stress tensor, and the same way you pick up these other terms. So you get actually exactly this combination from the operator product here, and that gives you this, this, this relation. I kind of uh, don't understand precisely the meaning of it. How am I doing with time, by the way? Um. You, you're running short of time. Okay, I'm going to finish. Oh, um, it's a little over. It's, it's 50 minutes, you're a little over. Okay, all right, I, I'm going to stop soon. Uh, I'm going to actually uh, stop where I don't know the answer precisely. I mean, I tried to construct, indeed, a, a good Dirac operator. The most natural thing is to write down the, the BRST charge on the half stream, where you integrate, say, to the mi midpoint. Uh, the only thing that I uh, had chosen is namely that also the, the ghost satisfied Dirichlet boundary conditions. Maybe I should modify this because actually then in that case this operator is not very well defined. Because these ghosts then have half integer mode expansion, while the stress tensor likes to have an integer mode expansion, so I don't know how to do this integral. Uh, the other thing, as I said, is the half string modes actually have ghost number minus one which means you have to absorb something like two additional ghost zero modes. So I was not really able to solve these problems. Actually, this is where I, I got stuck a bit. Anyway, I'm still uh, there with, with what I wanted to uh, achieve, but I, I, I have to find the correct uh, definition of this operator. Anyway, it's just an idea that I had at the time to see if there's some other formulation of open strings where we can uh, think about this action as being induced from an action of that sort. Anyhow, that was what I wanted to leave you with. Thank you.
Yes, when, when you had this uh, the square root of q. Yes. So that current, is that a conserved current which you integrate? <coughs> or does it depend on the contour of integration? You know, for the BLSD current, usually you integrate the BLSD current, which is conserved, so it doesn't matter if it's a conformal space. Good point. Um, so it's, it's, it's spin, so there, there's a uh, spin one, which, which you can write down a 1, 0 component and a, and a 0, 1 component. Um, I mean, as a total current, probably it is conserved. But anyway, uh, it's something that needs to be worked out. Uh, yeah, right. Uh, so, so when you start splitting this string into two halves, so this sounds like you, you know, work on some kind of manifolds with corners, right? You have a bulk, you have your string, and also you, you have those corners where you split it. So what, what would leave in the corner, right? You, you put in there some operators, but what kind of is it some kind of algebra or what what's in general would do live in, in the corner is, is, is there some kind of idea of what what's the structure you mean on the world sheet you're talking about I mean there are certain boundary conditions that that can be modified I mean this is what usually we have uh, No, I don't think I, I I don't have a lot to add to what I, I said here, to be honest. Mm. Maybe I just kind of a second question because from the very beginning I had the feeling that something strange about this 120 degrees, yeah. And maybe it should be fine not out not multiplication depending on angle, yeah. It's not just an algebra. The angle was the thing that was part of the story of, of, of Witten's construction. I think my construction actually go, does away with it because I, I, I merely get to an algebra, so I don't even need to work with the same pictures. Um, of course, I, I have an arbitrary um, um, midpoint, sort of, still. I mean, that, that issue is still there. There's some way you have to break the, the, the reparameterization invariance to do this. But uh, once you uh, calculate only BRST in variant quantity, that, that the dependence uh, must yeah. disappear, which is the same actually as in Witten's construction. No, and that's, uh, I think it's al almost similar. He had to go through some uh, um, consistency conditions to make sure that everything worked. And, but this would maybe even make it, I mean, make it easier. Yes. I had some conjecture how to relate boundary string field theory with Witten's cubic theory. So remember in that paper you mentioned I derived the action for boundary string field theory yes. in terms of disk partition function and things like that. So the, I, I'll explain it later. There was there are two terms in the action I derived for boundary string field theory. I'm impressed that you remember it, but that's good. <coughs> so there were two terms. Yes. And one of the terms was partition function, boundary yes. function. I want to interpret as taking the disk, dividing as much as 120 yeah. degrees, yeah. and that's a psi, 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 this is psi cubed, yeah. or okay. A cubed. Yeah. The first term was the derivative of partition function along the wet function. Yes. Right? So that one is uh, AQA, where Q and beta are identified in terms of the space of uh, uh, deformations. Okay. So I want you to bet that AQA comes from beta dz, mm -hmm. and uh, uh, the AQ comes from from z, where A is a uh, hundred twenty degree uh, divided this by three parts. On one side you have a boundary condition, as you say, arbitrary, mm -hmm. and on the other side, uh, no one. And problem always was in the middle, right? Okay. Because you need the side uh, A of x. Mm -hmm. And here is x, and here is the, the boundary of <laughs> Okay. Anyway, we'll, we'll discuss that. No, nice. Okay, so let's thank Gareth again. Right.